Thank you. Yes, um, indeed. When to refactor your code into generators and how. Um, so, yeah, after this presentation, um, you, you have learned, um, you will be able to recognize certain loop constructs as candidates for refactoring. You will know how to refactor these constructs into more maintainable, elegant Pythonic code. And you will have had your first acquaintance with the standard libraries, Itertools module, and the wonderful More Itertools package. But first, let's introduce myself shortly. My name is Jan-Heim Buurman. I am the author of the basic Python for Java developers tutorial on real Python. And I witnessed the first baby steps of Python very close more than 30 years ago when I was working as a programmer for the De Dutch National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science. And in my career, I was working mainly as a C and C++ developer, but I always kept an eye on uh, the developments of uh, Python. And I was e even able to occasionally use it in my work. Uh, my current employer for uh, more than 10 years now is uh, Ordina. It's a Benelux-based IT service provider. And when I was acting there as a Java unit manager, I came up with the idea of starting up a special Python practice. And this practice focuses on Python and software artisanship. I think it's quite special to have a dedicated Python practice where within a wide spectrum IT service provider company, you don't see that much, I guess. And the Ordina Pioneers are also a participating sponsor of the PSF. In the last couple of years, I do what I like most, and that is Python programming. In this presentation, I will introduce you to a family of similar functions. They involve loop, loops, they contain fragments of similar code, and I will show you how you can identify distinct, distinct responsibilities within this seemingly entangled code. I will touch upon the topic of generator functions and how these generator functions will enable you to refactor this entangled code into separate functions. And finally, I will introduce you to the utility generators and functions from the Itertools module and the more Itertools package. So, I'm going to tell you a fictional story, not a true story, about a Python team that will develop functionality for a product owner. And this product owner is representing the Fibonacci sequence fan club. And the product owner would like you to make a function returning a list of all Fibonacci numbers less than a certain threshold, uh, say n. And um, so, first of all, who knows what a Fibonacci number is? Many ends. So I don't need to explain it, I'll do anyway. Uh, the definition of Wikipedia states, in mathematics, the Fibonacci numbers form a sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, in which each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. So that's the essence. You start with two numbers, usually, most of the times, zero and one. There is some debate about the starting values, but let's choose these ones. And the next value is simply the addition of the previous two. So in this example, Zero is the first, one is the second Fibonacci number, and the next one, the third, is the sum of the previous two numbers, zero and one. If you add them together, you get the next value, which is one again. And uh, the next value is the sum of one and one, taken together, which is two. And uh, two, uh, one plus two makes three, three plus two, uh, two plus three makes five, three plus five makes eight, etc., etc. And that's how you build up this Fibonacci sequence. So the next step is to implement this in Python. A bit of Googling might bring you to Python's own documentation site, which contains an implementation of exactly this functionality. This implementation that you see here has another name. It contains type annotations and a doc string, but it's functionally equivalent to that uh, example function. So what does it do? How does it work? Well, first, you create an initially empty result list, a container. And subsequently, two variables are initialized to the first two Fibonacci numbers, the zero and the one I was talking about. And you could see these variables A and B as Fibonacci registers. Yeah, register A holds the current Fibonacci number, and register B contains the next Fibonacci number. And um, then you enter a loop, in this case with a, um, an uh, exit criteria that the current Fibonacci number 
must be less than uh, the threshold value, the provided threshold value n, and you simply append the, the current Fibonacci number to the list, and then you start calculating the next set of Fibonacci registers, and uh, you use the, that very nice uh, feature named sequence unpacking of uh, Python to do these calculations in one go. So you assign the next, the new uh, current Fibonacci number is equal to the value of the old next Fibonacci number. So you assign the value of the old B to the new A, and the new B gets the sum of the previous two values. And finally, when the loop exits, then you return the result list. So you present that to the product owner, and the product owner is happy. He says, oh, no, that's nice. Can you make another function uh, for this uh, Fibonacci fan club? And now he wants us to make a function that simply returns the nth Fibonacci number. So it's an indexed number. And it's zero-based, counting from zero. Uh, so Fibonacci number zero is the first Fibonacci number. Fibonacci number uh, index one, and one is the second Fibonacci number, and so on. We just make it zero-based. He's fa facilitating us programmers to make the stuff zero-based. So let's go to this new feature. You see the implementation right here. Um, again, you see these, uh, the initialization of these two Fibonacci registers, but you don't see the initialization of the container that holds uh, a list of values. And you enter, in this case, another kind of loop, not a while loop, but a counting loop. You're using the range function to simply count the number of iterations that you want to go, to, go through, and the underscore it's just a dummy variable that, that, you, that, that holds the counter, the counter value that you don't need, that you don't use. And within the loop, you repeat this calculation of the next set of Fibonacci registers, A and B. And once you're ready, you have gone through the number of times of, loop, of, the, of the loop, then you simply return the current Fibonacci number. So you, we could, uh, uh, in, in our thoughts, we could try to, to mimic uh, how the processor works in this case. So if you would pass n equals zero as the, as the threshold uh, or as the, the index, then you initialize a and b to zero and one. The range function does not cause any iteration of the loop, so a and b remains the same. You return a, so you return the value zero, which is Fibonacci number zero. And one more example, if you pass one, then uh, you assign, uh, then the loop is executed one time. So then the A gets the value what was before that, the B value, which is one, and then you would return one, which is indeed Fibonacci number on index one. So you demonstrate this to the product owner again. The product owner is still very happy gets even more enthusiastic and he says, okay, well, can you make two more functions for me? Uh, one function that returns the first n Fibonacci numbers and another function that returns the smallest Fibonacci number greater than or equal to a certain threshold again, n. So, more features. I'll quickly present you the two implementations of those uh, functions. Here again, you're returning a list uh, you have the A and B registers again, a counting loop. You uh, append the result as long as the loop uh, count uh, holds. And after that, you return the, the list. And finally, a bit of a different function, smallest Fibonacci number greater than or equal to the threshold. You initialize the registers again. You enter the loop while the current Fibonacci number is less than the threshold. You calculate the next Fibonacci number. And once the condition of the while loop does not hold any longer, then you have a value which is equal to n or greater than n, and you return that, that number. So you have now a set of four functions. And I could go on, of course, because the product owner is never satisfied. But again, uh, nonetheless, you see a collection of these four functions right here in, in a sort of uh, matrix uh, setting. And um, I guess you, I, I, see, I think you all see a pattern here, right? You see repeated code. The code looks very similar, but there are also statements that are different. And if you normally see that kind of code, 
uh, you automatically, to me, uh, at least I, start automatically uh, start acting in a kind of uh, refactoring mode. I want to refactor this because I see duplication of code and I want to get rid of this code. And what is this pattern that you see? The pattern that you see is that uh, you have some function uh, declaration, uh, you, uh, definition, it accepts some sort of parameter. Sometimes you need to initialize the container. In our example, it was always a list that you sometimes need to initialize. You initialize those two famous, uh, now famous Fibonacci registers, as I coined them. And you have some sort of loop, a for loop or a while loop. And in this loop, sometimes you need to fill the, the container with the, the current Fibonacci number. Uh, sometimes you simply calculate, uh, and, and then next you, sometimes you don't, don't do that, and you only need to calculate the next set of Fibonacci registers. And at the end, you either return the current Fibonacci number, or you return the, the built-up container. That's uh, how it's, that's the sort of the pattern that you see. Um, okay, time to start refactoring your code, because you want to keep it dry, you don't want to repeat yourself, so you start looking for ways how to refactor the code, extracting the common part into a function or a method. So a, short, a simple check, who knows what refactoring is? I see many hands, not all hands, so I can give you a short uh, definition recap of what refactoring is. Um, you restructure your code without changing its external behavior. And you usually do this to improve the design, structure, and implementation. But again, you make sure that the original functionality of the code remains the same on the outside. And uh, you do that for a reason. Because uh, if you do that, then you aim for making your code more readable, less complex, and better maintainable. So if you attempt to do that, in this particular case, it seems very hard. Um, the code that you want to extract is, is mixed up with control flow constructs and uh, it's, uh, the values are collected in a list and stuff like that. So it seems hardly doable. Of course, you could try to, to extract that one single statement that, initial, that, that calculates a new set of registers, for example, or the initialization of the two registers, but that's a bit of useless. You replace one line by another one-liner, so that's not so useful. Um, as a kind of apparently final resort, you could try to combine the functions in one golden super function. Yeah, so you simply make one function with multiple modes. So let's start with trying the first two requested features. And we will use, in this case, a mode flag to designate which of the two uh, features is actually requested. Um, but a warning up front, uh, what you're going to see is very ugly code, so put on your peril sensitive uh, sunglasses for a moment. Here it is. It starts already with the ugly type annotation, right? Uh, and as the author of Black, Bukas Langa, told us in his uh, excellent PyCon US keynote, uh, ugly type annotations are an indication of ugly code. And I think this example can only confirm that, uh, that statement. Um, I don't want to even explain what is happening here in this code. It's quite un unmaintainable, not so readable, uh, and uh, uh, you should also not take this contrived example too seriously. It merely demonstrates that uh, the resulting code is not maintainable, and this is not the way to go. We have to solve it in another way. So back to the drawing board again. And the solution lies in the fact that you have to take a step back and look at your code in a more conceptual way, from a larger distance, from a higher flying altitude, so to say. And then you realize that there is a data producing part in your code, the code that is calculating and provided the Fibonacci numbers, and there is a data consuming part, the code that either collects these values in a container or is checking some condition that identifies the moment to return the current Fibonacci number. And the data producing part is the part that you can isolate. So for that, we need to make a short uh, context switch, enter generator functions, because that provides our way out. Uh, you just make a function. If you want to make a generator function, you just code it as a normal function, but, except, but instead of that it contains a return statement, it returns yield expressions 
that provides the return values, the values that you want to give back to the caller one by one instead of all at the, at the same time. So uh, as a demonstration, I can show you a, a, a very basic uh, generator function. You see it here, it's called gen2, and actually it mimics the range function uh, when called with an argument of two. The range function with argument of two gives back first zero and then one. And this is uh, just an alternative implementation of that, uh, but also larded with some uh, print statements so that you can see what's happening when. And um, so uh, you yield the value, value zero, and just before that, you see uh, a print that, uh, that's indicating that that is happening. Likewise for the value one that is yielding, and finally, you see a print statement when it's about to return. Um, how do you use this function? You could use it through the iterator protocol. You create an iterator of this function generator, like this. I assign it to the, to the variable iter. And then if you want to get the first value, then you just call next on the iterator and you get the value zero back. And you see the print. So it only starts doing something when it needs to provide something. And it immediately stops as soon as it has provided that value. And if you want to get the next value, you just call next again, and then you get the value one, and you see the printout again. And if you want to get the next value, uh-oh, there is no next value, uh, then you get the, the stop iteration, which is perfectly fine. It's fully according to the iterator protocol. It's signaling that your iterator is uh, exhausted. There's no more value to give back. Uh, but you can also use it in a for loop, right? Like you're used to, and it looks like this. Um, so you just get the values back and it stops uh, neatly after it has provided the two values. How are you going to code the, the Fibonacci number using the generator? Well, that's what you see here. You see the registers again, A and B, initialized. There is an endless loop. That's uh, quite a difference from what you've seen before. And uh, in the loop, you simply yield the current Fibonacci number, the A register. And in the loop, uh, when it continues, you calculate the next set of Fibonacci registers. And this is all there is to code the Fibonacci number generator. Uh, and you could see this as perhaps the most canonical implementation of, uh, of a Fibonacci uh, function uh, when you code it in an imperative, uh, imperative uh, programming style. And how can you use this generator? Um, for example, if you want to get the first eight Fibonacci numbers using this generator, then you could uh, zip the result of your generator together with the, the, the result of the range, range function, and uh, you would throw away uh, the value that you get back from the range function because you're not interested in that. But you use that uh, because the zip function stops as soon as one of the generators stops. So once the range function stops, then also the Fibonacci generator stops. And it's the way, that's the way you can print the first eight Fibonacci numbers. So, we're set, problem solved. My, my talk could end here, but there's a little bit more that I can show you. Because we have these packages, iter tools, the iter tools module from the standard library, the more iter tools package from uh, uh, PyPI. And um, you can read out the, the the, the, the text uh, later, I continue quickly to show you how you can implement that first requested function using the Fibonacci generator combined with these neat tools. So for that, I first need to uh, point you to the take while uh, function, utility of the it tools uh, module. And the take while function takes a predicate function predicate function gets one argument, that's the current value that it gets back from the generator, and it takes an iterable, and that's the, the, the generator, the Fibonacci generator. And um, then the resulting function has become a one-liner, because you build up a list, uh, and the list takes, is, takes the values, the output of the iter tools take while, the, 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 the argument of the of the predicate function is just a comparison of whether the current Fibonacci number is less than the provided threshold, and the second argument is the Fibonacci generator. So that's all there is to is to create this first function. 
how would the second function look like? Well, therefore, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the iSlice functionality. Very shortly, you com can compare this iSlice functionality of the it uh, module to slicing a list in general, where you have these square brackets with colons, and you can provide a start and a stop value and a step value. It's in two forms. The first argument is always the iterable, and then either you provide only a stop value, or you provide a start and a stop value, and perhaps a step value. And uh, the difference with, with standard slicing a list in Python is that you cannot provide negative numbers. They should be positive. And there is another function from the more iter2 package, which is called one. And one simply makes sure that your iterator or your iterable uh, contains only one element. Not less, not more. If it's less or more, then it raises an exception. But if it's one, it extracts that value and returns that value from the iterable. And then you have a one-liner again, because you simply return what the one function returns and that extracts the one number from the iSlice uh, function or generator, uh, which is called with your Fibonacci generator, indexed at index n and stopping just before n plus 1. So you extract one value, and that's the, the implementation of the n Fibonacci number. Uh, the first n fibs, uh, you need iSlice again. Um, yeah, that's here. Uh, so you just uh, call the Fibonacci generator with i slice that's pr that says, well, give me the first that number of uh, Fibonacci numbers. And finally, uh, the smallest Fibonacci number greater than or equal to n, uh, we have a drop while function. It's comparable to the take while function, but it does it ex exactly x the other way, uh, x the other way around. So it takes a, a an iterable, and it drops values as long as the condition holds. And it only starts returning values after the condition does not longer hold. And the first function, you can guess it already, I think, gives you back the first value of a returned uh, generator. And if there isn't any, then it can, you, it can return a default value. And combined to each other, it's again a one-liner. If, uh, if, if the line was long enough, and uh, you see the result here. So you take the first value of a generator that drop, drops all the values as long as the Fibonacci number is less than n. And, uh, and if there is no value at all, then it returns none. So that's it, sort of, almost. I, encur I encourage you to read through the documentation of the Itertools module and the more Itertools package. It might probably save you some work if you have a good idea about the function, all the functionality that it has to offer. And it often makes your code more expressive as well, better maintainable, I guess. And there's a lot more to discover from these utilities. A final example is the chunked or, or, or I chunked function that partitions your, your generated data into chunks. This can be convenient for loading massive amounts of data into a database, for example, where you can uh, partition that amounts to very short, to, to shorter, still large, uh, but shorter chunks to keep it all maintainable and to keep it, to keep it also doable for uh, all your packages and modules that you're using for that. So you've heard about the following. Uh, you are now able to recognize the pattern of certain loop constructs as candidates for refactoring. And uh, I've introduced you to the generator functions to extract the data producing part. And uh, finally, the message is that the Arthur Tools module and the more Arthur Tools package might save you a lot of coding. So that's it. There are some resources and uh, links that I've used to come up with the definitions. And I would like uh, to thank you. Oh, by the way, all this code has been uh, all the, not the interactive sessions, but all the, all the functions that you've seen, the old variations and the new variations have been uh, tested using PyTest BDD. It was a fun exercise by itself. And you can uh, find out uh, how in my uh, GitHub uh, repository. So uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, there is still some time for questions, I guess. Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, we have some time for questions, so if you have a question, please come to the microphone. Ooh, silence. Yeah. yeah. Question. Uh, yeah, a little less of a question and more like a, a direction for like additional reading if people are uh, interested in this. Because first of all, thank you for presenting this. It's just like a, a little thing that, that I keep doing where um, I basically don't write loops anymore uh, because of generators and things like that. Yep. And it gets rid of what I think is actually the biggest problem with Python, that loops don't have their own um, scope. So uh, if you don't write loops, you don't have that problem, uh, nice and simple. Uh, so two hints for further reading. One is in the standard library, there's loads of other things to go with this, which you obviously don't have time to go into now, like the filter function, map function, yep. and plenty more, uh, which you can combine with these generators. Yep. Um, and another package that I would uh, like to recommend is a tools package with a Z. It's like a superset of uh, more ITER tools, which also goes into like lists of dictionaries and uh, working through those. Super useful stuff if you're interested. Uh, okay, thank you for the hints. And uh, of course, there's a lot to debate about whether you should filter and map on and not list comprehensions, but that's a separate discussion. Yes, um, thank you. I have a question as well. You were showing us lots of beauty, beautiful one-liners. Do you like writing long one-liners, and do you think that's uh, good for maintainability? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, you have to be careful, actually. I think it's a good question. It looks like I love it. Um, I, I, I was surprised by the end result that finally all these functions were one-liners, but that was not the ultimate goal. My goal was to make maintainable code. And indeed, I think I understand the question behind the question. You have to also be careful with one-liners, because the, you compress a lot of information into one line. So I guess that the first time you see those one-liners, you have to think a little bit, okay, what's happening here? So sometimes it's perhaps better, uh, better to create an intermediate variable that contains the generator or, or an intermediate generator, right? But um, so the answer is um, uh, perhaps silently, I like writing one-liners, but it was not the goal of my presentation. So if there are no more uh, questions, I'd like to ask you to, to give one more final applause to Jan Hein. And, uh, thank you very much.